Hi. Today we're going to be talking about the gender pay gap and the new government gender pay gap reporting regulations. I'm Scarlett Harris, I'm the TUC Women's Equality Officer. Um, before we start, I'm just going to explain the different ways that you can participate in this webinar. Um, so this is all new to me and you might know more about this than I do. But if you look below the video stream that you've got in front of you, you should see links for questions and polls. And if you've got any questions that you'd like me to answer, please submit them and I'll do my best to answer as many as possible. Um, you can also chat. There's a chat area on the right of your screen. So say hello, chat to the other participants. Um, and again, if you have a question, please put it in the question area, not the chat area. So first of all, talking about gender pay gap. I'm just going to explain a bit what I'm going to cover today. So I'm going to be looking at what the gender pay gap is, and apologies if you know all of this already, I'm going to start from an assumption that people don't know that much about the gender pay gap. Um, what causes the gender pay gap? What the new gender pay gap regulations that you've probably heard lots about in the media are all about? What we found out from the gender pay gap reporting regulations? And what we as trade unionists can do to close the gender pay gap? So, starting at the beginning, what's the gender pay gap? As I say, it might sound like a really obvious question and lots of you probably know huge amounts about the gender pay gap in your sector, in your workplace. So apologies if I'm telling you things that you already know. Um, but the basic thing to say is that the gender pay gap is the difference in average pay between men and women in a workforce or in a particular sector or in the whole economy. Um, the reason I'm spelling that out is because it often gets confused with equal pay or pay discrimination and the two things are linked but they're not the same thing and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, and there are different ways of calculating the gap which again we can talk about a bit more later so you can calculate the mean average or the median average, you can look at full-time employees, you can compare them to part-time employees or you can look at all employees full-time and part-time and depending on which way you cut it you're going to get really different results. So there's a lot of confusion about what the actual gender pay gap figure is and the reason for that is there are lots of different ways of measuring it. There's no one right way, um, there are just different ways depending on what it is that you want to capture and what it is that you want to show. As I said, the gender pay gap is linked to but is not the same as equal pay or pay discrimination. Um, equal pay means men and women are paid equally when they perform work, work related as equivalent or work of equal value, that's a really important one, work of equal value, which is a requirement under the Equality Act. So it's about two people doing the same job but being paid different rates of pay, whereas the gender pay gap is a bit more complicated than that. Um, and for more information about how you calculate the gender pay gap, if you actually want um, some formulas and calculations, I recommend looking at the TUC guidance on the gender pay gap for activists, which has the actual formula in there for how you can do your own calculations. So just a bit of information about what the gender pay gap in the UK currently is. Um, we have a gender pay gap for all full-time and part-time employees, so that's looking at everyone together, of 18.4%. Um, and the gender pay gap based on median earnings just for full-time employees, when you take part-timers out of the equation, is 9.1%. So you can see what a big influence part-time work has on the gender pay gap. Since 2011, the full-time pay gap has been falling at just 0.2% per year. Um, and the TUC has worked out it's going to take more than 40 years at that pace of change for us to close the gender pay gap. So we have got a long way to go um, and lots for trade unions to do to try to speed that up. Um, the UK's gender pay gap is well above the EU average, it's worth noting, we're right up at the higher end of gender pay gaps in Europe. Um, and tackling the gender pay gap and fighting for equal pay have long been priorities for trade unions. It's 50 years since the Ford Dagenham um, equal pay case, which is made very famous by Maiden, Maiden Dagenham. Um, and we know that unions are facing a much tougher climate for bargaining on equality issues yet they still tell us year in year out we do an equality audit where we ask questions about what unions are bargaining on and equal pay comes out as the most successful and the the priority on the bargaining agenda around equalities for trade unions so it's an area where unions have had most success in negotiating equality policies and um, so over half of unions have negotiated have reported that they've had bargaining wins on equal pay and gender pay gap 
So it's a really important area of work. It might be something that you've been doing lots of work on or you might be new to it. Next, I'd like to talk a bit about what the causes of the gender pay gap are. As I said, it's not the same as equal pay. It's slightly more complicated. There are different things at play. Um, you'll see on my little graphic that I designed earlier, the first thing we have there is discrimination. So you can see that that feeds into the gender pay gap. The little picture you've got of the man and the woman is meant to be the gender pay gap and the things feeding into it. Um, pay discrimination is one of the factors. So what we mean by that is possibly a straightforward case of one woman doing the same job as another man in the same organisation and she's being paid less than him. She might not know that, they might not have very transparent pay structures, but she's being paid less for doing exactly the same job. And I've got an example of that that I'll show you in a minute. Um, sometimes it's about men and women actually doing different jobs and different rates of pay, um, but when a trade union or a lawyer looks at it, they can make the case that actually those jobs are comparable, they are work of equal value, even though they're not the same. I'll show you an example of that as well in a minute. The next little um, thing on the graphic is occupational segregation which means a couple of different things. We talk about vertical segregation and horizontal segregation, which sounds like a lot of jargon, but basically vertical segregation, you're talking about where men are all in the top positions in a workforce or in a sector, and women are in the lower paid positions. So there are loads of examples of that. That's really common across lots of different sectors. One example would be, for instance, in a school where you have the head teacher um, and possibly the deputy head teacher being men, and the teachers, and particularly the lower paid, the midday assistants, the dinner ladies, um, the teaching assistants, all being women. And um, so that's an example of vertical segregation, and I'm sure you can think of lots of other examples um, in your sectors. Horizontal segregation is where um, a workforce or groups of workers within a workforce are made up mostly of men or women. So, for example, in the UK, we talk about women being in the five C's, um, which is cleaning, catering, caring, cashiering and clerical work. We've been talking about that for absolutely decades and it doesn't change. That's still where women's work is concentrated and those are the lowest paid sectors. And we can all think of lots of sectors where men predominate and they are much better paid. So for instance, engineering being an obvious example, but also newer technology kind of sectors, um, also very male dominated and very well paid. Um, the next one on my little diagram is unequal care and responsibilities and that covers quite a lot, that's quite a complex issue and hard to draw out and the, the basic thing that we all know is that women do the bulk of caring still in this country in our society for not just children but also elderly relatives or other dependents. Um, that has changed slightly over decades as culture changes but it's still the case that women are more likely to do the bulk of caring for their family. And this has a huge impact on women's pay. Um, and that impact isn't just about women leaving the workforce because they've got caring responsibilities. It's about their ability to progress within the workforce, if they're part-time, their ability to get promotions, the impact that part-time work has on women's pay, because part-time work is not just paid less in terms of what you take home at the end of the week, on an hourly rate, part-time work is likely to be paid less than full-time work. Um, we know there's a huge problem with pregnancy discrimination in this country. A recent EHRC report found that 54,000 women per year are forced to leave their jobs due to pregnancy discrimination. We also have a problem with the lack of affordable childcare provision, which can really limit women's ability to work full-time or the hours that they can work or their working patterns. Um, even though we know that we've got a right to request flexible working and that's been extended to everyone, not just parents, we know that it's still really hard for lots of women to access flexible working. And often, there's been a really interesting study actually that TC was part of, often it's those who most need to access the flexible working, so parents on low incomes that find it hardest to do so, and often it's men at the top of an organisation that have the most flexibility and the ability to say, actually, I'm working from home, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work the hours that I want to work. Um, so we know that flexible working isn't a reality for lots of women. Um, and we also have the motherhood pay penalty. So the TUC did a really interesting piece of research a few years ago, which found that women who had children earned less, not just than men, but than other women in the workplace who didn't have children. Um, and what's really interesting, and other studies have shown this as well, 
is that men who become fathers actually earn more than men who aren't fathers. So there's a fatherhood bonus and a motherhood penalty. Um, so a lot of that's down to discrimination. It's not actually just about women working part-time. Even when you take part-time out of the equation, um, women are being paid less. Um, and we'll see on the next slide a bit more about how the pay gap widens over women's working lives. Um, the next one, or the last one, is about the undervaluing of women's work, and that links in very much to what I just said about occupational segregation, about where women's work is concentrated in the economy. Um, and I think it's always useful to sort of think about why we value certain jobs more than other jobs. And you know, to take one example, it'd be hard to argue that childcare isn't a valuable and important job and that you wouldn't want a skilled, caring person who was absolutely dedicated to that job looking after your child. Um, yet childcare workers are some of the lowest paid people in the economy and they tend to be women. Um, and there are lots of other jobs that are relatively well paid um, that are predominantly done by men. So. I suppose what I'm saying is that the solution isn't just about getting more women into the well-paid jobs where men are concentrated, like the STEM sector, science, job technology, engineering, although that is part of the solution. It's also about thinking a bit more about why we don't value the jobs that women are currently doing, like nursing and caring jobs that are actually really, really important to our economy. The economy would grind to a halt if we didn't have women doing those jobs. So it's also about investing in those sectors um, and sort of talking about that as social infrastructure. So when we're talking about how the government budgets and what they're investing in, it's not just about big capital projects and building projects, it's about investing in childcare, investing in sectors that will create well-paid, skilled jobs for women, um, but will also support the care sector and enable more women to go to work because they've got, um, they've got care that they can rely on to help look after their families. So those are some of the causes, that's not everything, but that hopefully gives you an overview of what some of the causes are and how that issue about pay discrimination, equal pay, fits into a wider picture. Um, and it's worth bearing that in mind, we might come back to that slide when we're thinking about the gender pay gap reporting and what it tells us about different companies and their gender pay gaps. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, um, the issue about how motherhood and family responsibilities affect the gender pay gap. Um, I hope you can see this slide, but you can see how the gender pay gap widens over a woman's lifetime. It starts to widen out in her 30s, but then it jumps massively in her 40s and age when lots of women, not all women, but lots of women will have school aged children, but possibly other dependents as well. Um, and it really peaks in women's 50s. Um, at TUC, we've done lots of work around women in their 50s in the workplace. Um, and you can imagine the kind of factors that are at play there around having um, elderly relatives, possibly elderly parents, possibly a sick partner, having possibly still school aged children if you've had children in your 40s, but possibly having grandchildren that you're looking after as well, particularly given how expensive formal childcare is. We did some work that showed that actually lots of women in their 50s were having to look after their grandchildren because their daughters couldn't afford a nursery place. Um, or a child minder. And um, I also said that I'd give some examples of different types of pay discrimination um, and equal pay. And I don't know if you can see this, it might be quite small on your screen, but I've got one example here that you might have seen in the press, which was there was a big scandal around equal pay at the BBC. There's a picture there of Carrie Gracie, who um, was a foreign correspondent for the BBC, the China correspondent, who found out that she was being paid significantly less than male reporters doing precisely the same job, but just in another country. I think her comparator was the Washington correspondent. Um, and arguably her job was as skilled and complicated, if not more so than his, working in China, where there's a really complicated political situation. She spoke Chinese, she'd been working there for many years and was really experienced and found out that she was being paid less and um, quite rightly took an equal pay case and made um, a lot of noise about the fact that she has been paid less and lots of other women at the BBC and the MUJ have been really supportive of that case. Um, and the other picture you have there is a recent Tesco case. This isn't an unusual case, there have been lots of supermarket cases, but that's an example of where um, the two jobs being compared aren't the same. It's not that a man and a woman on the shop floor stacking shelves are doing exactly the same job at different rates of pay. The issue was women working 
on the shop floor being paid less than men working in the work in the warehouses um, and making the argument that those jobs were equally skilled, they should be paid equally, even though they're different jobs, um, they shouldn't be paid differently. And there have been lots of cases like that, both in retail but also in local authorities. Now I'm just going to move on to talking about the gender pay gap reporting regulations, which lots of you will have heard about. You might have been involved in um, in negotiations with your employer about these regulations, or you might have just read about it in the press. So just to whiz through what the regulations say, what's happened. Um, the regulations came into force last year in April, um, and all organisations with 250 or more employees have to report, um, and that's public sector, private sector, voluntary sector, all have to report. You can choose to report even if you have fewer than 250 employees. Um, the reporting is annual, and there's a snapshot date of um, the date in 2017. So the reports that we've just seen, a reporting deadline of the 4th of April 2018 and the 30th of March for the public sector, were reporting on what their gender pay gaps were a year ago in April. The regulations um, will be reviewed within the next five years and the enforcement of the regulations is going to be carried out by the EHRC. Um, we might talk a bit more about that later, what the enforcement and sanctions look like. And the information that's published has to go on both the employer's own website, somewhere visible and easy to find, but also a government website. And that information has to stay up there for three years. Um, the measures that companies have to report on, there are six different measures. One is the average gender pay gap as a mean. The other is the median average gender pay gap. Um, the average bonus gender pay gap as a mean and the bonus gender pay gap is a median, and then also a proportion of men receiving bonus payments and the proportion of women receiving bonus payments, and then the breakdown into quartiles, so that's the proportion of men and women divided into four groups ordered from lowest to highest pay. Um, and it's worth noting, some people know this, that some unions fall within the scope of, of those regulations, so some unions have more than 250 employees and some unions have reported um, and the TEC has also reported. Um, just a bit of history about the regulations. Um, the, prior to these regulations, the government had taken a voluntary approach. David Cameron, back in, I don't know, 2010, 2011, said that um, the coalition government would be the ones to close the gender pay gap within a generation. In order to do that, the then Home Secretary, Theresa May, set up what was called Think Act Report, which was an entirely voluntary scheme where employers were encouraged to sign up and to report not just on their gender pay gap, but whatever they felt like reporting on, basically. There was no clear benchmarking that you could report on if you had a mentoring scheme for women, on what your training scheme was like for women, what promotions had been given to women. You could report on how many women returned from maternity leave to your company. Um, so there was no one measure or metric which made it very difficult to compare. Um, and after several years of this voluntary approach, whilst hundreds of employers had signed up and said that they would report on something, I think ultimately there were only six who actually reported on their gender pay gap. Um, so it didn't prove to be very success successful in terms of shining a light on gender pay gaps. Um, so the next step the government took was to introduce these regulations. The TUC and trade unions have been broadly welcoming and have said anything that shines a light on the gender pay gap is a good thing. But we've also said it's quite a blunt tool. It's not showing you the reasons for any gender pay gap. You could have employers where they have an entirely female workforce on very, very low rates of pay, but they show up as having no gender pay gap at all. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily a good place for women to work because they're very, very low rates of pay. They might have terrible maternity provision. There might be all sorts of reasons why that doesn't make them a great employer of women. And the converse, you might have a large employer in a male-dominated sector that's making huge efforts to get more women into the sector, but they've still got a long way to go and they might show up as having a really terrible gender pay gap, but it doesn't necessarily mean they are a bad place for women to work. It just means they've still got a long way to go. They might be unionised, they might be really proactively trying to fix the problem. So we've argued that it's a blunt tool. Um, we've also said it's not the same as doing equal pay audits, and I'll say a bit more about equal pay audits later, so it's not showing you where there might be pay discrimination happening. Um, we've also said that we think that 250 is um, 
is too low a threshold that we should have we should include more companies in the reporting um, and we could include companies of 150 or more employees we've also said that other pay gaps could be reported on as well there's no reason why the regulations couldn't also call for um, reporting on part-time pay gaps or pay gaps by race or disability and really crucially we've criticized the regulations for not requiring employers to publish a narrative so that's explaining why they have a pay gap and what's going on in their company and really importantly there's no requirement for employers to publish an action plan so employers can say we have this gender pay gap full stop there's nothing we're going to do about it we have no intention to take action to close that gap they just have to publish the figure um, we hope that lots of employers will take action because they're going to be embarrassed by their pay gaps but what we really like would be for the regulations to to call for mandatory action plans. Um, and we've also expressed some concern about how easy it's going to be for the government to enforce these regulations and how tough the sanctions are going to be um, and what disincentives there are for employers um, who are thinking, well, maybe I just won't bother reporting or, or just won't engage with this at all. So um, now the gender pay gap reporting deadline has been and gone. Um, we know quite a bit about what companies have reported. As I said, it's all there for anyone to see on the government website. Um, and in terms of what we found out, compliance was better than expected. As I said, we were a bit worried about how weak the enforcement mechanism was and how weak the sanctions were. So we thought it was possible that actually lots of employers wouldn't bother reporting. But in fact, most of them did. Um, as of a couple of weeks ago, one in 10 employers that should have reported still hadn't done so. So there is a bit of an issue around compliance, but not as bad as we had thought. Um, unsurprisingly, I think probably to most trade unionists, um, this, this whole exercise showed that gender pay gap is a huge problem and it's really widespread. And eight in 10 companies reported that they had a gender pay gap. I think it's also really highlighted how poor the understanding is of the issues. A lot of the media reporting, a lot of the employers' responses when they were questioned in the press about their gender pay gaps showed that people really didn't understand the issues at all. They didn't understand the difference between the gender pay gap and equal pay. A lot of the reporting was around this idea that this must mean that there are men and women sitting alongside each other doing exactly the same job, being paid differently, which isn't necessarily the case. It might be the case, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, and we also found out that bonus gaps are a widespread problem. Again, possibly not that much of a surprise to trade unionists, but we found that that was an issue even in the public sector. Um, and we found that actually large concentrations of women in the lowest paid roles were what were really driving the gender pay gap in a lot of companies, rather than lack of women at the top, although that was an issue as well, um, just in terms of a numbers game, as the fact that we have so many women concentrated in the lowest paid roles that was really driving the gap for a lot of companies. Um, as I said, we found out that it's a problem across all sectors. And this slide, I don't know if you can see it all, but you can see um, that the gender pay gap reports by sector and the little dotted line down the middle is what the average gender pay gap report is at 9.7%. And you can see the construction, finance, education, communications, energy, science, all well above the average, but across the board, there are gender pay gaps. So um, there's work for all of us to do. And here, having talked a bit earlier about vertical occupational segregation, I thought this example of gender pay gap reporting um, gives, it just really highlights what we mean by vertical occupational segregation. So we all know Ryanair and JP Morgan, and you can see that the orange bar is women and the purple bar is men. And you can see that in Ryanair, We've only got 3% of women in the highest paid jobs and women overrepresented in the lowest paid jobs. I imagine that the highest paid jobs at Ryanair are at board level, but also pilots. Um, and there'll be lots of women ground staff, women cabin crew who paid very, very low salaries compared to those pilots. Um, and JP Morgan similarly only has 9% of women in those high paid jobs. And I think that's quite common in finance that you have a real division between the clerical and cashiering jobs. The women who will serve you when you go into your high street bank, or the JP Morgan's not a high street bank, um, versus city bankers and people at the top of the bank who are making huge amounts of money and huge bonuses. 
Um, and as I mentioned briefly earlier, we were quite surprised by just how bad the picture was in the public sector. I think everyone expected the private sector to look bad, but there were some quite um, surprising results in the public sector. So we know that the public sector is much better unionised than the private sector, generally speaking, and the public sector workforce is predominantly female. Um, and yet we have seen, for instance, two thirds of councils and 90% of NHS trusts reporting gender pay gaps. Um, one example of um, a government office, the Office for Nuclear Regulation, had a median hourly pay gap of 55%. Um, and bonuses were also quite a big problem in the public sector, which perhaps lots of people wouldn't have expected. So, for instance, the University of Liverpool reported a 90% bonus pay gap, um, the University of Manchester, 87% bonus pay gap, um, and in some of the hospitals, so the Sheffield Teaching Hospital NHS Foundation Trust, 94.3% gap. Um, so, yeah, some interesting things there about um, pay structures in the NHS as well, um, and I think particularly issues around occupational segregation. So now we know a bit more about what the gender pay gap reporting has shown us, I guess the next question is what are trade unionists going to do about it, what are unions doing about it? Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be an annual process, so employers have just reported on their 2017 figures and they will have to report again next spring on their 2018 figures. Um, but it's worth, when you think about that, that means the snapshot date has been and gone. So anything that you manage to negotiate with your employer or anything that your employer does do in the next year, which we hope they will be doing to try and fix any pay gaps, won't show up in next year's report. So I suppose the first thing to say is that unions and employers need to be thinking long term about this. There's nothing you're going to do right now that's going to give you a better gender pay gap report in 2019, you're kind of, you already should know where you are for 2019. Um, I imagine that lots of you are already thinking about how you can push your employers to do more and there's lots more they can do. So if they haven't reported, even if that's because they have fewer than 250 employees, you can encourage them to report and point to the fact that lots of employers with fewer than 250 employees did report. Um, and even ones that, you know, you'd think that that would just be companies that were doing really well and they were quite boastful about the fact that they had a really good gender pay gap um, figure. But actually lots of them, it wasn't a particularly rosy picture that they were painting. They were doing it because they thought that was the right thing to do and that they should be leading by example. Um, so there are good examples of employers publishing where they don't have to. Um, and you could push your employer, if they have reported, to report on more measures. So I mentioned some of those earlier, um, about whether they could also be reporting on ethnicity or disability, for instance, or part-time pay gaps. Um, I'd really like to see unions also pushing employers to carry out equal pay audits, which are different to gender pay gap reporting. So that's actually looking at what men and women are doing within the company and whether they are being paid fairly, whether they are being paid the right rate for the job um, and checking that there is no pay discrimination happening and that should happen regularly. It's not good enough if, if your employer says, yeah, but we did one of those 10 years ago. That's something that you should be doing, not every year, but on a fairly regular basis and in conjunction with the trade union. We'd also really like to see unions pushing employers to formulate action plans to close their gaps and we really believe that where there's a union in the workplace, the employers must be working with the trade union to do that because the union is probably best placed to know what the solutions to these pay gaps are and what the employer should be doing to fix it. Um, there's obviously lots of scope for unions to start digging around in the data they have, and I know unions are doing that already. So the government website is very searchable, it's really easy to use. You can type in the name of your employer, you can export all of the data onto an Excel spreadsheet and search it in different ways, by location, by size, all different ways. Um, and I think that's probably a really useful tool in collective bargaining. As I say, I know lots of unions are already doing that, not necessarily just in terms of your pay negotiations, although that's an obvious place to start, but also looking at um, bargaining around equal pay audits, bargaining for enhanced family and carers leave and pay, like better maternity packages or shared parental leave packages, better access to flexible working policies, for instance, or even things like support for childcare. Um, and also the TUC and trade unions will continue to lobby the government to do more on this because whilst we're really pleased that we've got these reporting regulations, we do think there is more that they can do. 
um, and we're going to keep on making that case. I mentioned that it would be really good to, um, to press employers on having a narrative and an action plan. So just a few words on what that might look like. Um, it's really important that the narrative is an explanation, not an excuse. And we did see that lots of, um, lots of the company reports as they started to drip feed into the media, particularly some of the worst ones with really high gender pay gaps where they were then asked by the media, what's going on here? What's the narrative? The, the responses that were coming back were excuses rather than explanations. So rather than saying, actually, we recognise that it's occupational segregation that's the problem here and we need to do more to fix that, the response was a very defensive kind of, well, it's nothing to do with us. It so happens that women work in these low-paid jobs and it so happens that men work in these high-paid jobs and there's nothing we can do about that. Or, for instance, employers in STEM sector or very male-dominated sectors saying, well, there's nothing we can do about it, the fact that women don't come into this sector. Um, whereas we would say actually there's a lot that employers can do to try and um, do more to recruit and retain women in male-dominated sectors. So that's just a really um, important starting point, is that the narrative needs to be an explanation, not an excuse. It shouldn't be defensive. It should be a very honest appraisal of what's going on and what's driving those gender pay gaps. And then the action plan should link into that, um, sort of thinking back to that earlier slide with my little diagram, there are different drivers of the gender pay gap and um, they might all be at play or there might be one that's more dominant than another in a different workplace depending on the different issues. Um, and identifying what it is that's really driving the gender pay gap is going to inform what goes into the action plan. So there's not a one size fits all action plan that's going to apply to everybody. Um, and it could be a range of actions. So some of it, if you think pay discrimination is the issue, then job evaluations and equal pay audits are going to be a really good starting place. Um, and I really recommend if that's the route that you're going down um, or if you're talking to your employer about doing that, that you look at the EHRC website where they've got really practical guidance on how you carry out an equal pay audit um, and what different pay structures um, what the different risks are in different types of pay systems in terms of systems that are more likely to lead to equal pay issues. So for instance, performance related pay or having lots of bonuses or having very, very long pay scales. So it takes a long time to work your way up. Um, all of those are quite risky practices in terms of pay. It could be things like improving access to flexible working, thinking back to that issue around women's caring responsibilities and the impact that motherhood has on the gender pay gap. Um, offering enhanced maternity, paternity and shared parental pay leave schemes um, and providing support for childcare costs, which used to be um, more common or there used to be more employers actually offering on-site creches, for instance, and you don't see that so much anymore. Um, and given the exorbitant cost of childcare in this country compared to other European countries, um, actually I think there's a real role for employers to play in supporting um, supporting parents with childcare costs because we know that that is a real factor in particularly women's labour market attachment and women just dropping out of the workforce or taking low paid part time work because they can't afford childcare. Um, and as we're just talking about STEM and male dominated sectors, there's lots that employers can do to actively recruit and retain more women. Um, and that could even involve working with union learning reps, looking at the apprenticeship system, if they have an apprenticeship program, um, and looking at how you get young people into the organisation, getting young women into the organisation and keeping them there. Finally, I thought it would be useful to have some further sources of information. Um, I really recommend all of these, but particularly, um, I mentioned this earlier, I don't know if you can see that, um, this is a piece of guidance which covers lots of what we've talked about today. It's on the TEC website if you look for the Gender Pay Gap Reporting Guidance for Activists um, and that's quite easy to print off. Um, it's just a simple format there. Um, there's also lots of EHRC guidance. I mentioned the guidance around equal pay audits and job evaluations. They've also got lots of information about gender pay gap reporting um, and also actually lots of detailed data and reports on the gender pay gap. So there's fascinating information on there if you want to find out more about pay gaps by ethnicity, for instance. Um, and there's also a really great website that I'd recommend you look at if you're interested in this called the Equal Pay Portal, um, which was set up by someone who used to work at the EHRC and is a real expert on equal pay. There's even a section on there on trade unions. 
Um, it's got up-to-date case law, so interesting equal pay cases. It's got information about gender pay gap reporting um, and lots of great data and information and really clear explanations of the gender pay gap. So if you want to find out more, for instance, about how the difference between the mean and the median, that would be a really good place to go. Um, the CIPD also produced some really good um, guidance for more employer facing, but it might be useful if you're talking to um, your employer, if you're talking to management about this issue and they need more guidance, that might be something that would be useful to pass on to them. And there's also really good information on the ACAS website. Um, I think that's all in terms of my slideshow. And I don't know if we've got any questions. Yeah, we've had a few questions. Um, so the f we'll see how many we can answer for what we've got time for. So the first one um, is I've seen some employers blame the fact that they have high gender pay gaps on the fact that they have lots of women part timers. How would you counter that? OK, so I think first of all, if they're talking about the gender pay gap reporting, that doesn't quite stand up because the reporting is on the hourly pay figure. So it shouldn't make any difference whether they're part-time or not and if they're saying that we just pay our part-timers less per hour then that's really something that they should be addressing rather than just kind of washing their hands of that issue um, and I think that also ties into what I was saying about um, the issues around women and caring and the impact that has on their pay and the fact that part-time pay is so much lower paid than full-time work um, and that employers need to think about how they can make part-time work available across the organisation. Often women who want to work part-time once they've had children find themselves having to take a step down in terms of their skills and their experience in the organisation because they're told that part-time working doesn't exist at the level they're at. So they might take a more junior role and often never quite get back to where they were across their working lives. Um, so it's really important that employers are thinking a bit more um, creatively about what jobs could be done part-time, about job shares, about modelling that across the organisation and not just for women, for men too, um, and right up to the higher levels of, of the organisation. Um, another question, how can I find out whether or not my employer has reported on its gender pay gap? Okay, so if your employer has more than 250 employees, they should have reported, although as I said, some employers haven't. All of that information is available on the government portal. I think if you just Google uh, government pay, gender pay gap reporting review, um, it should take you to the website where you can search all of that information. Um, and if that's not the easiest way of finding it, I'm sure we can provide a link afterwards um, so people can find it. And as I said, it's really easy to search. You can literally just type in your employer's name or you can search by sector. Um, or you can search by location and you can find all of the information. Um, and if it's not there, you should probably be asking your employer why not. It might be that you have fewer than 250 employees, um, but I would still say that you should be talking to them about whether they could report next year, even though they don't fall within the scope of the regulations. We'll link to that. Um, we've got a question saying, what about smaller companies? Can or should they report even though they don't have to? Yeah, so if you look on the government reporting website, actually, you can search by size of company and you can see that actually a lot of employers who were smaller than 250 employees did report, and I include the TEC in that. We've reported, um, and a couple of other smaller unions, I think, we did as well. Um, and yeah, there were employers who did, and we would encourage that because the trade union line all along has been that 250 um, is actually quite a large employer and it's missing out huge numbers of workers um, because lots of workers are in smaller companies. So we would really encourage smaller companies to report as well, and you can absolutely do that. Um, it's you register in the same way if, if your employer is coming back saying, but we can't do that because we haven't had any information. So if you're a larger employer, the government proactively contacts you saying you have to report, here's your code, here's how you do it. If you're a smaller organisation, it's down to you to contact them and say, I would like to report um, and they will explain what the process is. Um, just a, a, a quick note, um, we've, we've had quite a few questions, but if we don't get time for all of them today, um, we'll ask Scarlett to like, write some replies oh, on, okay. on, the, on, the, on the portal, just in case we don't get time to do all of them. Uh, so another question, 
What are the most practical, concrete actions that union reps can take in light of the gender pay gap data? Mm -hmm. And what should we be asking of management? Okay, can I go back? Can you switch back to the slide? You can. So I think I might have covered some of that. Um, I mean, I think, so it's the slide that's what's next for union slide 15. Um, I think lots of unions already are taking this to um, the negotiating table and talking to employers. There's, there's a lot of opportunity there. Some of it is about actually mining that data um, and using it with employers to try to bargain for better pay. It might be it might be very practical things, for instance, where there are lots of women concentrated on the lowest pay grades. We've had examples of unions where they've literally just done away with the lowest pay grade and immediately uplifted all of the lowest paid women in their organisation and immediately shrunk their pay gap quite significantly. Um, so there are things like that that would be of huge benefit to, um, to everyone in the organisation, but particularly to the lowest paid women. Um, obviously, there are different ways of managing pay negotiations. I'm not going to tell you how to do your pay negotiations, but sometimes flat rates for the lower grades can have a huge impact. Um, but in addition to talking about pay, I think it's a really good opportunity to talk to employers about flexible working, about the availability of part-time work across the organisation, about support with childcare, about enhanced maternity packages, and, and now as well, paternity and shared parental leave packages um, and I know those things are harder to bargain for in the current climate um, but unions still are pushing on those things and it's still really important that we do because all of them actually have an impact on the gender pay gap um, and as I say it really depends on what's going on in your company and what you think the real issues are it might be that if you are working in the STEM sector that you think what you really need to do is focus on working with the employer if possible on different recruitment drives or looking at actually we know that in STEM it's not just about recruitment it's about retention and that lots of women drop out once they have children because often some of those STEM workplaces are not very family friendly there's not a lot of flexible working um, and also linking it to other things that you're talking to your employer about and so for instance we've also been doing lots of work recently on sexual harassment and we know that that has a huge impact on um, on the choices women make about where they work and whether they stay in a workplace. We know from TUC research that some women are actually driven out of their workplace altogether by sexual harassment. Some of them would prevent them from going for a promotion or, or going for a job in a male-dominated environment, even if that's the next office along or if it's making a move to the warehouse, for instance, that's all men, if they know that there is a problem with sexual harassment there or there's a culture that is really hostile. Um, so making some of those links about some of the barriers to women going into some of the better paid jobs in an organisation, I think is a really good starting point as well. Um, but also just kind of pushing them on the other things as well. Have they done an equal pay audit? When was the last job evaluation? Um, and yeah, trying to just push them a bit more on what they're doing. Um, can you mention the exemptions? Um, so some public sector employers haven't reported because they've reported elsewhere. Mm. Can we say anything about that? I don't have to come back. We to can come back that. to that one. Okay, no worries. Um, I wonder if that's to do with under the public sector equality duty that they should already be reporting and um, doing equal pay audits. I don't know. I'll have a look into that. Um, so we've got one here. Um, in response to our request for a meeting, management at my workplace have informed me that they are establishing a committee that will be dedicated to addressing the pay gap. How should we respond to this as union reps? We are wary that the committee will simply be a talking shop, mm. co-opted by management, which is unable to enact change. However, if we dismiss it from the start, then we may be seen as failing to engage in good faith. I think that's always the dilemma, isn't it? When you can see that something is maybe um, not not what you would want it to be. If you don't engage, then you're not in the room and you can't influence it at all. And I think as, as frustrating as it might be that it, there is a potential that this is a talking shop, it's more likely to um, yield results and to be useful if the trade unions are in the room. So if there's any way of making sure from the outset and, and influencing what the scope of that that working group is, what the terms of reference are, um, trying to boost trade union representation on that group and finding ways of kind of reporting back to trade union and 
and sort of feeding in properly, um, I think that's really crucial. I think actually being in the room is probably the best thing you can do in that scenario, even though it might not be perfect, it's going to be better if the union reps are in the room. Okay, so I hope that answered some of your questions. Um, I will happily try to respond to questions afterwards if there are other ones that have come in and I'll come back on that public sector question. Um, and I hope that was useful. As I say, I do recommend that you have a look at our guidance and have a look on the website for more information. Um, and I really hope that you have success in negotiating with your employers on the gender pay gap. Thank you.